Good morning. Good morning, everybody. The 12 of you that are here. No. Slow gathering cloud this morning. Um, we have a brand new song we're going to do today for the sermon hymn. It's called All My Boast Is In Jesus. Gary has got the words up. Thank you. Or, or Dorothy's got the words up. Uh, this is from the Getty team, uh, the Boswell, Matt Boswell and Matt Papa and Keith Getty. It's a great new song, but it's brand new. And it's different enough, the, the verses are different enough from the bridge, are different enough from the chorus, that I would like to do the whole song with you this morning. So we're, we're gonna, we'll, we'll run through the whole thing, so hopefully after you're done you'll be all clued into it. But uh, here we go, we're going to run through All My Boast is in Jesus. What wonder of wonders, what love is this, that Christ would die for me? His goodness, His merit, His righteousness, the sinner's only plea. Oh, foolish pride, be crucified, the work is made. Here's the chorus. Christ. 
we'll see you with that at the sermon hymn. So Brian may have mentioned this while I was outside, but just listen for the flute. That's playing the melody, so you should sound like a flute on that song, okay? Just so you know. But Janae's playing the melody. If you follow her, then you'll, then you'll be getting that song. What a great message it brings. Today is Reformation, and it brings the message that all of our hope is in Jesus. During the time before the Reformation and, of course, during, there were many people who thought, if I just try really hard to be good, if I, if I do the best good works I can, then somehow just maybe I'll make it when I die and I'll be with the Lord in heaven. And, of course, that's not the message of the Bible, is it? The Bible says none of us are good enough. However, Jesus is good for us. Jesus gives us eternal life as a gift. And so we'll focus on that today uh, in the sermon uh, as we uh, worship today, thinking how Jesus puts us all on level ground, both in our sin, none of us measure up, but also in his victory, we do measure up in him. And we'll do that on the basis of Romans 3 today, and that'll be the first sermon. Oh, that got an interesting, that got an interesting reaction, because I'm preaching two sermons today. The good news, I think, is that they're both short, uh, but I want to uh, talk about the glory of the gospel for Reformation Sunday. And at the end of the service, for about 10 or 12 minutes, I'm going to talk about the hope we have as citizens of heaven. Because the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven with Christ. And we often face times of uh, difficulty or frustration or political conflict as we obviously are in with despair and discouragement you know we don't we're not helpless victims here and I'm going to talk about that uh, toward the end of the service today so you get two sermons for the price of one uh, today as we worship today uh, we rejoice to receive the Lord's Supper uh, it's called the sacrament of the altar yesterday I met with some of our new uh, confirmation student families, our junior high students, to give them uh, training and instruction for the Lord's Supper. Uh, in fact, Will today is going to be receiving the Lord's Supper for the first time today, so you might uh, wish him uh, congratulations today because it is a precious gift. Well, what is it? Jesus took bread and wine, and he said to his disciples of the bread, take eat, this is my body. Of the wine, he said, drink it, this is is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The teaching of the Bible is that when you kneel here, you receive bread and wine, but also you receive the body and blood of Christ, whether or not you believe it. And that was an interesting thing we talked about yesterday in our instruction. And, and so we want to make sure that people receive this gift to their blessing, not to, as the Bible talks about, judgment. And so that's why we ask people to go through a little bit of instruction before receiving the Lord's Supper, because Jesus wants us here, but he wants us to recognize what he's about, what he's doing when we go. So if that's new to you, we'd encourage you to hold off on receiving the Lord's Supper until you have that instruction. I'd be happy to start that conversation with you after church, as would our elders who are raising their hands this morning. If you are visiting with us out that back corner door, if you turn right you, in the hallway, you'll find restrooms. If you turn left and go to the corner, you'll find a nursery. If you do a left hairpin turn, you will find a cry room, which is uh, most, for the most part soundproof, uh, and you can take young children there uh, if needed. Today is Reformation Sunday, the glory of the gospel. You'll hear that in the readings today. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ. He has done it all. What joy we have. Let's stand and sing. <clears throat> What love could remember the wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sin.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, because of our sin, we cannot be made righteous in your sight by our own efforts. We praise you for giving us righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to live in the confidence and joy of your gift of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> the Old Testament readings from Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. New Testament readings from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God apart from, the, from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I skipped the line. Uh, Jesus Christ, to all who believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned 
and fall short of glory to God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ, Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through the faith of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, <clears throat> he, he had left the sins committed beforehand. Unpunished, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present of time. So as just and, the, and one who justifies who's those who ha have faith in just Jesus, where then is boasting? It is excluded on what principle? On that of observing the law. No, but on the earth of faith. For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. This was kind of the word of God, but I think I was off a little bit. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The name of our piece is Teach Me, O oh Lord. We all need to continue to learn. It's great. <laughs> choir sat down, I'll ask you all to stand. <laughs> Thought I might get you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This time we invite the young children forward for a message for them. While we do that, our ushers hand out our red worship registration books. Uh, members, if you would update any email or fo addresses or phone numbers, if you're visiting with us, um, that would be a way for us to get to know you. So I'm wondering, someone at Altar Guild, was there a poll over here in the corner? Somebody took? That, that was my children's message, so... <laughs> That's all right, I'll make something up, it's fine. No, I, I got it covered, don't worry about it. All right, good morning, you guys. Uh, so good to see you today. So if you look around the church, you see those banners on the wall? Like, um, I don't know what's in the back. There's a purple one back there. You know, when I came in this morning, it, it was at an angle. Somehow, maybe uh, one of the big fans that blows had made it wave in the air and it moved it so it wasn't level. So we had to fix it. You know how I fixed it? Do you think I, I'm tall enough to reach that string at the top of that? You think I am? No. How about we look at this red one? See that one, it's nice and close to us. You see there's a little uh, piece of string that goes up to a tack in the wall uh, above it. So do you, do you think I could reach that? Let's go, let's go, let's walk over there and take a look. Okay, this one's easy to reach right in the bottom. But this one, can, it, can any of you guys reach that one? Are you tall enough? Okay, you are, okay. How about this one over here? You can get up to the leg of the lamb. How about this one? That one's even up there, you can't get it. Now, if I picked you up and I put you on my shoulders, you could probably reach the very bottom. But, but even if I did that, would you be able to reach the string at the top? No. 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 You're right, we need a ladder. Then we could do it. Yeah. Or how about changing the light bulbs in the ceiling? I don't think there's a ladder that reaches that. Now, they have special tools. They call them a lift. And they have a little motor, and it's, it lifts people way up there. But even those have limits, don't they? You couldn't wash the windows on a super tall building with those. They actually have people on ropes and pulleys, and they go down from the top. I mean, that would be a scary job, wouldn't it? There's just no way that any of us would be tall enough to wash windows in a super tall building. Well, why am I telling you all this? Because in our Bible reading today, the second one that we heard our elder read today, we're told that no one will be justified in God's sight by doing good works. Well, what does that mean? That's a big church word, isn't it? What it means is nobody is good enough to go to God and say, I did it all right. Have you ever gone to your mom? and say, clean my room. And did she ever find something that wasn't clean? Or your dad? I bet, I bet they probably did, didn't they? Or have you ever said, I got all my homework done. And then the teacher says, well, you need to do the next page too. And you go, oh man. There's, there's always something that we just need to do more when it comes to our relationship with God. So we're never supposed to lie, are we? But sometimes we do. We should never say, bad words and hurtful words to other people, but sometimes we do. We're always supposed to obey our parents, right? Sometimes we don't. And so what the, what the Bible teaches us is that none of us are good enough. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough, right? None of us are good enough people for God to say, sure, come to heaven. You've earned it. So how do, how do we have eternal life then? We trust in Jesus. He's the one who made it, right? You doing all right? You doing okay? All right. So Jesus is the one who did good, everything right. He never sinned. He never made a mistake. He always did what his heavenly father wanted him to do. And what he did was save you. How did, how did Jesus save you? What did he do for you? He died for us on a cross, right? And then he rose from the dead. And he gives you 
his perfect life that's credited to you. And that means when God looks at you and me, he doesn't see our sins, he sees what Jesus did. And that's good news, isn't it? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for earning heaven and eternal life and the new creation for us. Thank you that you are good even when we are not. Amen. All right, you guys, see you later. Thanks for coming up. What wonders, what wonders, what love is this that Christ would die for me? His goodness, his merit, his righteousness, the sinner's only plea. Oh, foolish pride, be crucified, the work is finished. All my boast is in Pray with me. Lord Jesus, all our boast is in you. What a joy to be able to sing that together to you this morning. For you have opened eternal life to us. Bless us now as we hear your words. Strengthen us in faith that we might serve you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Level ground. We're all on level ground. That's what this text is about. It is not the easiest stuff to read, is it? Paul loves these enormously long sentences 
uh, in, in Romans and in Ephesians especially, he'll go on and on uh, for phrase after phrase after phrase. But what we're going to find out today in this brief little first sermon is that it's not super complicated, at least when it comes to salvation. Now, I didn't watch much of the Olympics this summer, but I get, did get to watch the men's high jump a little bit. So I started looking at men's and women's high jump and pole vault, and I wanted to, to see the results. Uh, for women, the high jump final was won by someone who jumped two meters. That's 6.56168 feet. That's pretty tall, six and a half feet. For the men, it was 2.36 meters, which is 7.742782 feet. <laughs> about seven and three quarters feet. Now that's, that's just running, jumping up to go back over a bar that's seven and three quarter feet off the ground. Most ceilings are eight feet high. That's way up there. So then I looked at the pole vault. The women's pole vault was one at a height of 4.9 meters, which is just a shade over 16 feet. And the men's pole vault was one at 6.25 meters, which is about 20 and a half feet in the air. That's amazing. But you know what? Even the best high jumpers and pole vaulters eventually fail. At a lot of meets, including the Olympics, when one person has won uh, the event, they'll often raise the bar a little higher and they'll go for a world record. And every once in a while, someone does get a world record, like the men's pole vaulter this year. He's by far the best in the world, and he broke his own world record. But when the next time when he sets it higher, guess what's going to happen? He's going to fail. There's nobody that can pole vault 30 feet in the air or 50 or 100. It cannot be done. There are limitations to human skill and athleticism and endurance. And one of the main messages, and the, I'm going to give you two, but the first main message out of this passage from Romans 3, 19 to 28 is none of us measure up to the bar. And the bar is God's standard. Now, what do you suppose God's standard is? Pretty good? Really good? No, God's bar is perfection. Why is that? Because he created us that way. God did not intend us to, to lie and cheat and steal and kill and all those sins. We were never made that way. And we were able, Adam and Eve were at least, to attain that bar for a short while. But Adam and Eve chose to go their own way, and we have done the same. And so Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. How many people will? None. No one. I think I shared with you a verse from a few weeks ago. Jesus says, only God is good. And Psalm 14 says, there is no one good, not even one. And so you and I don't measure up. So in high school, I did high jump and pole vault. And I got nowhere near the numbers I've shared with you this morning. In fact, when I did high jump, I did it because nobody else would. And my coach said, we can get some points for our school's team if somebody will go on the high jump. So I did it. And, you know, you, you may have heard of the Fosbury flop. Well, I did sort of like the, the summer somersault. It was pretty ugly going over the bar. And that was back in the day. I had glasses since I was in fourth grade. So I'm a freshman in high school with these big, nasty, ugly glasses. And I would come over the bar. And you're supposed to be all flexible like this. Well, I'm not very flexible. My knees would come up. Do you know how many times I broke my glasses? I was that nerd with the white tape around the glasses right here. Uh, thank God for super glue. That's all I can say. My, my height was not very good. The pole vaulting I did was even worse. It was... Um, it was probably a little dangerous, to be honest. And that's the way it is. So even, even if spiritually, some of us, you might think, well, you know, I look like Pastor Allen trying to high jump. I, I don't do so well spiritually. And I, I make mistakes. I, I don't always tell the truth, or I did something I shouldn't have. And, and some of you might think, well, I'm more like that champion pole vaulter, and I, I, I've got experience, and I'm doing pretty well. But I'll tell you what, nobody reaches the bar. Jesus makes it abundantly clear in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, that's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And here's what he says in Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22, for example. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You see, Jesus takes sin 
And, and he, he helps us to realize it's not just what we do on the outside. I haven't stabbed anybody. I'm not guilty. He says, no, no, it's what's in your heart. Do you, do you hate someone? Well, then you're like a murderer. He does it again in verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, the bar is not just what people can see on the outside. The bar is, is in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, all of which are corrupted. So none of us measure up. We all flop. We all fail. We're all on level ground. As Jesus said, there is no one good except God alone. Now that would be depressing if we stayed there. But the beauty of the Bible is that while it uses the law to crush our, our arrogance and our thinking, we're, we're hot stuff spiritually, it does that so we will look to Jesus in hope. And that's the second thought in this text that I want to share with you today. We're on level ground due to our sin, but we're also on level ground due to Jesus. So in Romans 3.21 it says, But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. That little word from was a huge word for the Lutheran Reformation. As Martin Luther began to read his Bible and get away from some of the false teaching of the day that was so common in the church, that word from blew him out of the water. You see, he was one of those guys that was trying to pull vault higher and higher spiritually. He would fast for days, go without water or sleep. He would punish himself in every way imaginable, trying to purge the sin from within him and become a righteous person, a good person, even in God's sight. And he realized, I just can't attain that height. He was better than most people, but better than most people isn't good enough. And then he saw this word from. But now a righteousness from God. And that's a word I want you to remember today. That your righteousness, it's not about you and what you have done or, or avoided doing. Your righteousness is from God. And so the next couple of verses say, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned. We're all on level ground and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So there's the gospel in a nutshell. We all fail. There's the law. But the gospel, the good news, is that we're justified freely. It's a gift by what Jesus did for us. In his death, he goes to the cross and takes our imperfection upon himself. When he brings us to faith, we're going to have three baptisms at the late service today. I'm so excited about that. When we're baptized, that righteousness is credited to us as if we did, as if we did it right all the time. That's how your Heavenly Father sees you. That is a miracle, is it not? That is a joy. And that is what we celebrate on the Reformation and every Sunday. So let me summarize this as we close this morning with sermon number one. Oh yeah, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> so at the Olympics, you have the podium at the end of each event, right? And you have gold, silver, and bronze, right? First, second, and third. And, and you have places. And, and the hope is that you will stand at the very top. You will be the best in the world at whatever event you're in when all is said and done at those Olympics. But only one person can win. The podium of Jesus was a cross. And to his enemies, it looked like Jesus was the biggest loser ever. He looked like a complete failure. In fact, they mocked him on the cross. Hey, if you are the Christ, the Son of God, come down from the cross, you loser. And what they didn't realize is Jesus, even then, was in, standing in victory. And when he died, he said, it is finished. I've done it. And he rose from the dead on the third day to clearly reveal his victory. The men's high jump. That was, happened to be the, like the one event I actually watched. And there were two guys that were definitely better than everybody else. And they tied. They each reached the, the, the highest height of all the competitors. And it was offered to them, you could share the gold or 
you can have a jump off. We'll lower it a little bit, and whoever does best, you know, we'll keep lowering it until somebody succeeds and somebody fails. Well, there was one guy who said, let's have that jump off. I, I don't want to share. He was American, by the way. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And he lost. He finished second, which is still a great accomplishment. But instead of sharing the gold, he ended up with silver. And that's how it is in this world, isn't it? We, we want to be first. We want to be better than everybody else. We don't like sharing the podium. But the miracle of miracles is that our Lord Jesus goes to a cross. He's treated as the sinner for us. He dies and then rises from the dead. And then he says to all of his people, come on up to the podium. Come on up and share first place with me. I want you to share in my victory. And so when we hear the gospel and are brought to faith, when we are baptized as infants and brought to faith, that's Jesus sharing the podium with you. You have a place in eternity. You have a place as the winner because Jesus has shared his victory with you. Now that, my friends, is amazing. May God give us great joy as we recognize that we are on level ground of our sin to keep us humble, but on level ground with Jesus to give us joy and confidence. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 7 of the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious Father, fill us with gratitude as we contemplate the free gift of righteousness you have given us in Jesus. Send the gospel powerfully into this world that the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus would bring life and hope to millions. Lord God, we all have sinned and fall short of your glory. Relieve burdened consciences with your gracious words of mercy. Jesus, you act in mercy to save us. We pray that you will bring healing according to your will to Willie Zobel, Susie Casaza, Ken Munitz, and Lothar Lehman. Also bring comfort to those who carry burdens of grief, anxiety, or fear, especially the family and friends of Darlene Eilders and the family and friends of Mike Shaw, both of whom died this past week. Lord, in your mercy. Bless our nation with Christians who carry the gospel in their words and actions. Let us be a people who bring the message of Jesus to a culture deeply divided. Give us the wisdom, O Lord. We commend ourselves and all people into your hands. Amen. Amen. We greet each other with the peace of Christ.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, 
in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink. You lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
to share some thoughts with you today and then pray for our nation as we approach an election. Uh, I, I am on Twitter and uh, I do that mostly to follow sports, but uh, there's a lot of other content on Twitter right now, as you can imagine. And so what do we do with this when we feel distress for our nation? We look out and if you're older like me, we can see incredible changes over the last 40 or 50 years. The way we view sexuality and marriage the way we look at drug usage and alcohol usage, uh, the way we talk to each other. Uh, and, and it's very frustrating when you look at, um, well, let me say it this way. Many people look at how the government behaves and we can become jaded. Uh, some folks go to one extreme and they get super involved and we're going to make some changes. And then other folks get to a place where it's like, you know, I'm just kind of checking out. I just... I have no time or patience for it anymore. And we can feel like victims, helpless victims. And I've heard it in my own thoughts sometimes, and I've heard it from some of you a few times. And I'm here to say this morning that we are not helpless victims. In fact, I would submit to you that we in the church are in a far better position to effect change in our culture than the government is. And we have forgotten that. Because we, we talk about the government has failed here and failed there, and they haven't done this, and they haven't done that. Or they have done this. This passage in Philippians is pretty important. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We as Christians, and I'm talking very broadly in the United States now, not just us, but we as Christians 
make this same mistake over and over again. We put our hope in this world, in this life, and this United States of America, and the leaders who are here, and we forget our hope is we're waiting for a savior. He's gonna make all things new. And so, yeah, of course we're gonna be disappointed in people because all have, uh, so we're dealing with a bunch of sinners. What do we expect? It's like when you get married, right? You get married and you think, well, man, life is going to be perfect now just as soon as I fix my spouse. <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? It just doesn't work. So let's not forget our identity. We are blessed to live in the nation we do, and, and we should do what we can as good citizens to be involved where we need to be and to vote and to make our voice heard. We are not quietists as Lutheran Christians. We do not withdraw and say nothing. That's not what God calls us to do. But let's not forget where our true citizenship lies. It's with Jesus. And you know what? In, in eternity, it says there will be people from every tribe, nation, language, and people. People aren't going to care what country you're from. All that's going to matter is that we are citizens in God's kingdom. So what can we do? Well, I used an illustration with church council this, this last week. And... Uh, I want to use it with you. I, I was going to look the numbers up, and I just ran out of time this week. But just as a guess, how many employees are employed by the federal government? Somebody told me that a few years ago, they heard it was 10 million. Okay? So let's say it's 15 million now. Let's say there's 15 million federal employees. How many employees are there of state government? I don't know, let's, let's add 10 million more. And just for fun, let's raise the total to 40 million employees, either of federal or state government. I think I'm being kind of generous. How many Christians are there in the United States? The population is around 370 million, I believe. At least people who say they are Christian, it's well, well, well over 200 million people. So who has more employees? The government or God? Simple math would tell you we got more than they do, right? And what would happen if just a, a small percentage, 25%, let's say 50 million Christians did what we read in this passage. It's printed in your bulletin, so yes, you can take it home. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Huh. Anybody feel convicted in this room? We are grumblers, aren't we? Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Do we live in a warped and crooked uh, world? Of course we do. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on that, that troubles us as it should. So do we give up? No, Paul says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Another translation says, as you hold out the word of life. So let me, let me just do this thought experiment with you. What would happen if a small percentage of those Christians, 25%, let's say 50 million of us today started living without grumbling or complaining or arguing? I think that would have a major effect on our culture. But too many times it's we, the Christians, who are grumbling and complaining. And Paul says, you know, instead of grumbling, complaining, arguing, those kinds of things, what would happen if you held firmly or held out the word of life right in the midst of the darkness? There's light in the darkness, and we are it. Remember, Jesus calls us in Matthew the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Do you think he meant that? Do you suppose he meant that? Yes. Yeah, he did. And that means we are not helpless victims being carried along by the great sweep of history and we should all gnash our teeth. No. No. We are people of light. The gospel people of hope. You see, when you grow in your knowledge and understanding of God, then you're able to explain to a friend what sin is and what it has done to our world and why we are in the place we are. 
That's why we go to church. That's why we do Bible class. Right now, you are helping our nation by being here. Have you ever thought that? I would suspect most of you have never thought that. But by being here, Jesus, the light of the world, makes you light. Because when you are given grace, you are more gracious. When you are forgiven by Jesus, you become more forgiving. When you learn the truth of Scripture, you are better able to speak the truth in love. One of the best things you can do for the United States of America is come to church every week and be in a Bible class every week and learn and grow. But we just go, well, maybe I'll come, maybe I'll not, whatever, doesn't matter. No, don't complain about the culture then if you're not going to do something to fix it. Know Christ, know him well, know his word, and then you have something to say in our culture. And then I want to encourage you to have non-Christian friends if you don't. It is so easy to kind of get wrapped up in church, and for me, doubly so, because this is where I work during the week. But we got to know our neighbors and our co-workers and our classmates, people that don't know Jesus, because how else are they going to hear about him if we don't say? And pray for them. Pray for them. Because as you make and build deeper friendships, a moment may come after three months or three years when you can actually have the conversation they need to have where you tell them about the hope that Jesus gives to you. And parents and grandparents, you know, make sure that your children and grandchildren, insofar as you are able, hear the gospel in your life. In other words, show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. Be open and transparent about sometimes it's hard, but show them Jesus. Because our children are growing up in an insane culture. They need Jesus. So today, you're doing something to help the nation by being here. I want to encourage you to keep doing that. The world needs more changed people, more gracious people, more patient people, more forgiving people, more gospel-centered people. That's you. So let's do more things without grumbling or arguing. Let's do more things to carry the gospel into the world. Let's, by Jesus' power, be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Because when we do that, we will hold out this word of life. We will be reflecting Jesus, our Savior, who died and rose for the sins of the world, every nation, even the United States of America. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love our country and we grieve over some of the terrible things that go on in our society, in our government, and in our homes. Forgive us for acting like helpless victims. Forgive us for grumbling and complaining and arguing and saying nasty things about people, especially our leaders, instead of praying for them. Help us to admit that we have failed by not passing the gospel on to the next generation. And then change us, Lord, by your grace. Help us to be bearers of the light of the world. Jesus Christ, the gospel in the flesh. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's stand for our closing hymn.
Please be seated for a few brief announcements. A reminder that Fit for Life, our class that studies the basics of the faith, continues. And even if you haven't been coming, I want to invite you to come today. We're going to just continue learning about God. We're going to look at the Bible today, and probably some of that will spill over into next week. Why should we trust the Bible? We'll look at that. Today, after the late service at about 1230, there'll be a town hall and lunch regarding a, a smaller proposal for a prayer path. Uh, please come to that. Uh, you can sign up as you go today. We're ordering pizza, so we need to know how many folks are coming for that. Coming up soon is the LWML Craft Fair and Bake Sale. That's the 15th and 16th from 9 to 2. If you're interested in being a vendor, talk to Kylie. Kylie's here. If you would raise your hand, Kylie, uh, you can talk to her about uh, getting a space there. In conjunction with that, there are desserts needed for the bake sale. So pies, cookies, bars, cupcakes, etc. You can bring some of that. That would be greatly appreciated. We've had a slight schedule change, and on the 24th now, that's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, there's going to, we're going to offer Surviving the Holidays. It's produced by the same company that does Grief Share, and so if you have lost a loved one or you have a friend or a neighbor who has, I'd certainly encourage you to come or to invite them to come because this is very helpful when you think about that first Thanksgiving, first Christmas without your spouse or without your mom or dad, that can be very challenging and this will help you to prepare for that. So it's the 24th from 1 to 3, that is a Sunday. A couple of memorial services upcoming, uh, if you are able to attend. Wednesday, November 6th, there'll be a memorial for Mike Shaw, who died this past Tuesday. Uh, Mike always sat right about back there, uh, in that back third of the seats with his wife, Linda. And then coming Sunday, November 10th, at 2 p.m., uh, there'll be a memorial for Darlene Eilders, who died a week ago today. So if you're able to come, great. If not, please keep those families in your prayers. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.